morning. All right, now I know what it's like uh, to be the recipient of uh, a gong invite and what all of you see when I uh, when when it's using my Zoom link. So this is great. Uh, thanks everyone uh, for being on the call today. Thanks Enrique for um, setting this up and um, kind of just laying out uh, really what this program is about. Again, we'll cut to the chase. This flex program is about driving transactions, okay? I think that should be good to cut to the chase with all of you because th at the end of the day, this program is opportunity for you to connect with as many buyers as possible and close as many deals as possible. And as a result, also build your sphere of influence as much as possible, okay? When you win, we all win together. And so that's what I want to drive home today uh, with the team is to give you an idea of how we're doing right now. I'll give you a snapshot of all the other, uh, how we're doing relative to the other partners in San Jose. So we have actually eight other flex partners that work in the San Jose market. Um, and um, I'll show you some metrics here. Uh, and we got some catching up to do. So just so you know, on a monthly basis, what I communicate to Enrique and Jason is how many deals, how many escrows do we need to see on that month uh, to be, uh, we call it a transaction target uh, and your attainment to that a target every month. Um, that number is based on the amount of leads that you received in the past. So obviously if your team has received more leads in the past, you're held more accountable for more transactions, meaning more deals in escrow. Okay, so just so you know, that's the context here. Our goal, our target for the month of November is seven. Seven deals in escrow, okay, flex deals. Okay, now, as of today, when I ran the report, and I'm, I'm glad I saw in the chat that there's someone that's submitting offers. As of today, we're at zero, okay, deals and contracts. What that means is month over month, uh, if we are failing to hit the targets, we decrease the amount of leads that we send you. And eventually, if it falls below a certain threshold consistently, then your account gets flagged uh, for disengagement, which means that if uh, performance does not improve, you get turned off from flex altogether. Okay. So let me just be fully transparent here. The deadline here, because we just uh, we're, we're start, we decided that we're going to give some grace period on how we measure performance till the end of the year. So by uh, December 31st, our team here needs to be above 75% to their transaction target. Now, what's that transaction to target? Again, it, there's a monthly target, but what we're measuring is how you performed in the last six months. So we're looking at the last six months of performance. So in December, it'll be July, all the way to December, all the targets for each of those months, we add that up together and we look at how many deals went into contract for flex in each of those months. And then that's your attainment to target. So we need to be at a minimum of 75%, okay? Roll uh, on that six month. So right now in our six month look back, we are at 86%, okay? 86%, which is above that 75%, but again, we are we have a goose egg so far in November. So that means in uh, when we roll into December, if we don't close any transactions, we don't hit our target this month, that 86% is going to drop because the month of November's attainment uh, you know, was below what was expected, which is seven transactions in contract. Does that make any does that make sense, everyone? Okay. That's why it's super important for pipeline management. That's why I love it when people put in the Slack, like, hey, I'm submitting offers for a flex buyer, right? Because as soon as we get to a point with a buyer where we're submitting offers, that's that's where we, you know, we we, you know, we rub our hands and go, okay, I hope this goes in contact. I hope my offer is accepted. And if it does, then great, we log that as a transaction, uh, a deal in escrow. So pipeline management with the team here is super important. That means that when Enrique and Jason um, look at uh, the Flex pipeline, which I'm going to show you in a second here, they need to have the confidence of being able to communicate with me. Hey, uh, Andrew, the team is working a lot of these leads. We've got a lot of buyers that are going to be submitting offers this month. We expect that, yeah, we'll be at around seven or 10 or whatever that number is, deals in escrow based on how we're seeing these buyers move down that transaction funnel, 
okay? And that transaction funnel that I'm referring to, that's just synonymous with uh, pipeline clarity, having a clear view of where the team is with uh, moving every buyer that they connect with down that pipeline, uh, that funnel, and, um, and how individually you're doing it as well. So I know I'm seeing a lot of words here. I'll show you some visuals to, uh, to drill this home. Uh, but any questions so far? Let me pause really quickly. Uh, for Andrew, yeah. real quick, just, just to clarify, the deals count when we get them under contract, right? So when they say the target for the month is seven, that means seven under contract, seven yes. offers accepted uh, for these flex leads. Now, we did a survey yesterday with the team uh, of how many hot you know buyers they're working on right now. And I think we had over 30. I don't know which ones of those were from flex or not flex. So maybe guys, if you guys could type in the chat right now, how many hot Zillow flex clients do you have right now that have a good chance of getting in contract before the end of the month? If you can drop that into the chat, how many hot Zillow flex clients are you working with right now that have a good shot of getting in contract that are actively looking at homes, want to submit offers, stuff like that. Drop those in the chat for me right now. So at least we can kind of uh, catch up a little bit here. Yeah. And, and Enrique, just, just to kind of go into that, I did that. I sent out a doc for everyone. And the number that came back just, just so that we know was 19, 19 buyers that we can possibly get in contract in the next 14 days. Right. And I want to make it clear that just because I want to make I want to see which ones are extremely hot, guys, not just, you know, maybe looking at homes, but are at least they're ready to write if they find the house and we can get them in contract. The survey I took, we had 19. Um, that's one thing I want to mention. The other thing is, um, Andrew, if you can just kind of bring it home on how important it is for them to make sure that they get credit for their work and make sure that every client is in the right category so that we have the correct data to go ahead and look over. Absolutely. Um, yeah, I'll show you this uh, funnel here. Um, before I, I go to the screen share here, um, I would say, well, I just went to the screen share here, but uh, thanks for putting in the chat. I would put another layer to this. Everyone who put a number there uh, of potential you know, deals and contract this month, I would send a separate email to Enrique and Jason and list the name of that buyer and some other important details. Because here's the reason why. We can all throw numbers out there, right? One, two, whatever. And we can, and, and Jason can say, hey, we've got 19 on here. But there's an accountability uh, here that I think needs to be drilled down with the team here, which is if you're going to put a number out there, you've got to name it, right? You've got to put a name next to it, not just because, hey, we want to verify it, but because Enrique and Jason need to know, you know, which deals you're working on with who, so that they can call you and say, hey, how are you doing with, you know, Joe Brown, right, that you uh, said you're going to be submitting an offer for, who's the listing agent, right, where's this property, have I shown this property before, do I know that listing agent, is there anything that Jason and Enrique can do to help make that deal happen? Right, so it's an accountability factor, but it's also bringing visibility for your team leaders to be able to help you. Um, maybe it's, hey, before you submit that offer, let me have a quick look at it, right? Make sure that it's a solid offer being written. Um, they may know the listing agent, right? And may be able to drop a quick call to that listing agent and say, hey, Juan uh, is part of my team. Uh, and we're gonna make sure that this deal goes through smoothly. Um, we're, we're buttoned up with everything here. And so again, it's just not just accountability, but it's visibility uh, so that Enrique and Jason can help uh, if they can. Does that make sense? So if everyone can do me a favor, uh, after we get off this call, email them as well and say, hey, here are those buyers that I uh, plan to submit offers for within the next 14 days. The name and whatever information you want Enrique and Jason to know. Okay, maybe it's the, the address of the listing, their price point, their time frame, any other detail that you think is important for them to know so that they can uh, help as much as possible too. And Andrew, to add to that, if I may, I think it's important that we work together on these things because there may be certain things that you're not seeing because you have your own lens and Jason and I having, you know, tremendous amount of experience and, and stuff like that. 
and even just connections throughout the industry, like we may have these other little insights or these other little competitive advantages that we can give you that's going to help push your deal through, right? So uh, especially right now with the market being tricky is we want to have as much, um, as many things on our side, right? Like if, if we can have three brains working on a deal better than one, that's going to help us get, you know, inch it forward, you know, even more. So working together, guys, is important. Don't just go at it alone. Make sure you're leaning on leadership, the other senior agents on our team to see what other angle can we approach this lead with so that we make sure it gets in contract the first time. Awesome. Um, not sure if everyone has seen this before on the screen. This is uh, the team's uh, performance metrics in Flex. There's a lot of numbers here. There's a lot of data. But if you've seen this before, great. If you haven't, what this is, is how your the, how the team has done collectively on all the leads that they've received within a certain time period. The time period that I, I measure and I send, I send a couple time periods, but the one that we want to look at today is the last six months. So leads that the team has received in the last six months. How have we performed on those leads, right? Because that's what's being measured now is, how many deals in escrow we put in in the last six months relative to the target? Okay, so in the last six months, the first thing you want to look at is the number of leads that you've received from Flex. So that's about 1,200, right? A little over 1,200, 1,257. Of that 1,257, right now, 255 of them we rejected, right? So um, I'm going to trust that they should have been rejected. That's either if it was an agent calling or uh, a solicitor or somebody who said, hey, I was just looking, please don't ever call me again. Not interested. Great, reject them. There's also 800 of this 1,200 here. That's in nurture. So that this is actually a pretty big number, 64. Uh, that's like 80%, more than 80% of our leads that we've seen in the last month are in these buckets here. So the first question is there's 800 that are in the nurture status, which probably means that I'm gonna assume that these are buyers that, hey, they're not ready to buy yet. Their time frame is pushed out or they have some uh, extenuating circumstances that prohibit them from really being in a position to buy right now. Maybe they're going through a divorce, bankruptcy, um, or they're not looking to really be serious until summer of 2023. Great, we put them in nurture. However, there's a, a huge amount of opportunity here that someone needs to be looking at. So Enrique, Jason, we need to talk about how we're handling this giant bucket of leads here and who's handling them, okay? So that's 80% of the leads. So that means roughly like 20% that we're working on here. That's all of these buyers here. And this is the number of buyers in each stage here. So we have 74 buyers currently right now of the 1,200 that we received in the last six months that are in the showing home stage. When I look at a pipeline, what I, I, I look at is what's the, uh, what's the lowest hanging fruit that we have right now to put deals in contract. When I look at the, this pipeline, I see here, this 74 buyers that are in showing homes, and this is what Jason did, right? He pulled uh, the, uh, this 74 buyers, and we know the agent that it was assigned to. What I wanna know, and what all of you should be communicating to Enrique and Jason is how many of these buyers that you're working with that are in showing homes, when, how close are they to submitting an offer, right? So some of these that are in showing homes, you, you've only met with them maybe twice. You've seen a handful of homes, not quite ready yet. Or they're going through some financing things to, to you know, to get their financing uh, ducks in a row, right? So not yet ready to submit an offer. Great. But of this 74, how many are right to be submitting an offer? Right. How many, you know, how many of these buyers have you gone out with like multiple times? You've seen a lot of homes. They are ready to buy. They got all their financing squared away. Um, when can we expect them to submit an offer? That's what you need to communicate to Jason and Enrique for pipeline updates. There's also some buyers here that are in the met with customer stage, which is, as I think we've talked about this before, this is that first date. So you get the connection call. You set the appointment and you meet them for the first time. Maybe you do a little like kitchen counter, you know, consultation, or uh, maybe you have them come into the office for a uh, buyer's consultation. 
and maybe, or maybe you saw one house or a couple houses in that first meeting, it's still the first date, right? So this is another bucket of opportunity depending on how that first date went, but it's not as mature. This These 52 buys here, um, the way I look at this, these they are not as mature as the 74 that are in the showing home stage. But I'm hopeful for as many of these 52 to move down this funnel, right? Move down this funnel to making it to showing homes. What we're talking about here is pipeline update. And for you to be able to look at your own pipeline, all the buyers that you have and be able to identify why they're in the specific stages that they're in. And the goal here, team, is that every buyer you get, you should within seven to 10 days know if you're going to be moving them down the funnel or if you're going to be moving them out of the funnel. Out of the funnel means either they're rejected or they get put in the nurture bucket. Does everybody, would everybody agree with that or anybody have any um, comments on that? What I'm talking about here is a strategy which I've been, which I introduced to Enrique and Jason a couple of weeks ago is the down the funnel or out the funnel strategy. And that is that within 10 days, when you interact with the buyer, you pretty much know, are you going to be able to transact with them fairly soon, fairly soon, meaning within the next six months, or is this a buyer that you're going to reject or shelve and shelve meaning put into the nurture status? Okay. If we do that, we have pipeline clarity. Uh, sorry. So is somebody going to jump in and chat? Uh, Thomas Roscoe asked the question, how about pawn leads that are not interested or already bought? So any leads that just say not interested or already bought? Um, yeah, I'd, I'd probably ask more questions on that one. Um, if they already bought a home, then, then yeah, you have to decide if that's someone you want to stay in touch with. But not interested, Andrew, if someone says not interested, how would you handle that, that call? Yeah, if they said not interested and if they said, you know, hey, stop reaching out to me, like I, I appreciate it, but it's a, it's a little much, like I'm, I'm not going to buy. If they tell you to stop, you, you need to do the right thing and reject that lead. Otherwise, you get in a situation where they go, hey, I told you to stop calling me or texting me and you didn't stop. Like, what's the deal here? Right. So, yeah, that being said, if they tell you not interested, if they tell you not interested, you know, ask another question like, well, is that not interested forever? Or is it like, hey, you're just like a year or two from buying. And if that's the case, I wouldn't reject them. I would put them in nurture. And again, Jason, Enrique, we need to figure out a system for how we attack this giant bucket of nurture leads, right? Because if the agents stick them in the nurture bucket, um, they're busy working with high intent buyers that this bucket tends to get neglected. And the worst thing that happens is when you finally dive into this nurture bucket and you call a buyer that, uh, hasn't been reached out to for two months, and all of a sudden you find out they transacted with a different agent. That's because we didn't have a plan for how to work this bucket of leads here. And that's a bummer, right? If the buyer ends up transacting with someone else who was responsive to them and gave them a little more love. Yeah, so uh, Roscoe, you said the ones that say forever do not contact. Yeah, so if they say forever or do not contact, then that needs to be a rejected one. I think that's what Andrew just said. Yeah, yeah. if they if they also uh, said they transacted, you know, already, um, they're probably not going to transact again. I, I would just kind of ask a couple more layering questions. Oh, yeah, so which property did you end up purchasing? You want to, in your mind, it's like, I just want to confirm that they did. And they're not just like sending up a smoke screen to get me off the phone. Because sometimes that's what buyers do, right? They just don't have time to talk, but they don't want to be rude. And so they'll say something to get you off their back, not knowing that if you tell them that and you reject them, like you're never going to call them again. They just, it's just like when you go to a store, right? And a salesperson comes up to you and like, hey, can I help you? Can I help you? And it's like, hey, I just need like 10 minutes to look around. Can you not bother me right now? And you say, no, I'm just looking, but you intend to buy something, right? So think of that mindset, right? If you're calling someone and they, and they tell you like, yeah, I, uh, I bought a home already or you know, not interested, like ask a few more layering questions before you make the final decision to reject them. Because if you reject them and that buyer, uh, you know, two weeks from now jumps back on Zillow, sees a house they like, clicks contact agent. If you reject them, that lead goes to a different team. 
doesn't go back to you. And they'll get connected to a different agent on a different team. And if they transact with that agent, how would you feel if that was like a $1.5 million deal that you lost out on because you took their word for like, I'm not interested and you just rejected them. Okay. In this market that we're in right now, you've got to, you got to deliver tremendous value. These leads are not coming in left and right anymore. Right. So we've got to really dig in uh, and make sure if we're going to reject something, like make sure that it, it needs to be rejected or should be. Jay, you had some? Yeah. Let me just add guys, you know, one, one thing is this, because if they say they're not interested, what I like to ask them, hey, Andrew, at one point, you know, I understand you're not interested. At one point, you were interested. What has changed, right? Because I do have some newer agents on here, and I want us to be able to use that term or use that phrase. Great, Andrew, I totally understand you're not interested, but at one point, you were interested. What has changed? And then they're going to give you the reason what has changed, whether the rates, whether they lost their job, whatever it is. But I want us to make sure we're asking that question when they're saying they're not interested. Yeah. Hey, team, I want to focus on one specific metric here. Obviously, the most important for us is, and, and most important for all of you, is getting deals and contract, right? Because once we do that, then we can start to you know count on uh, the likelihood of that closing, and then you're collecting you know, your commission from that. That's the happy day when that happens. But I want you to look at the visual here on the screen. This is a funnel. And the only way to close more deals at the bottom of the funnel is if we don't restrict the funnel at the top. So that means that as best as possible, we need to be setting appointments with as many of the buyers as possible through uh, the proper execution on that call, meaning use the ALM framework on that initial call to get that appointment, to lock in that appointment and make sure that they show up. That's the next stage that we're actually focusing on this quarter, trying to improve for all of our partners is the met with rate. Again, the met with rate is the first date. So you set the appointment on that connection call and we need to make sure that as many of those buyers show up to that first date that you set. Okay, right now as a team, the leads that we received in the last six months are First date percentage is 38%. That's not good. So that means we're getting, you know, just look at the visual here. Out of 856 appointments that we set, we got first dates out of 477. That's like half. So half of the buyers didn't show up. They ghosted us or they canceled at the last minute. Okay, they're, they're, we need to get face to face with more buyers because all of you know here you know a phone call is just like the tip of the iceberg there right once you get face to face with the buyer it really breaks the ice and makes them feel comfortable and you drive that relationship a lot farther when you get with them face to face now that can be done via zoom too this is more this is the second best thing if they're like out of state or they can't meet at least if you can put a face to the voice and they can see you and you can see them, the connection gets much better. Okay. I want to show you here the email that I, I sent to um, Enrique and Jason yesterday. I know it's kind of small here, but I told you that in the San Jose market, we have eight flex partners. Our first date rate, okay, our met rate is 38%. That actually ranks us last of, of all the teams that flex teams in San Jose. That means the other teams are meeting face-to-face -face with more buyers than you guys are. The more face-to-face -face meetings you have first dates, the more buyers you will be able to meet with on second dates and third dates and drive a more deeper relationship with that buyer. And the more buyers you have in that pool, the more opportunities you have to submit offers. For more buyers and the more offers you submit the more deals we get in contract do you see the visual here of the funnel how that how that plays out you see here our funnel here the the right side of the funnel is the top 10 percent msa stands for market service area now this is this is all time numbers this is not just last six months that's why it's so much higher but still if you see the standard 
the San Jose market, the flex teams there are setting are are they have a first date rate of 64%. That's their metric in their met rate. So we're like half of that right now. So we need to figure out team how to open up the funnel here, right? So the, the, the bigger the funnel is in the middle here, the more opportunities we'll have to submit offers, right? And, and get more deals in contract. Because right now our contract, our conversion rate is 1.67% on leads that we received in the last six months. Okay, so let that sink in at, in terms of performance in terms of getting deals in contract, right? Uh, out of 1,200 leads, we put 21 in contract in the last six months. That's leads received in the last six months, right? So 1,200 leads, out of that 1,200, 21 of them went in contract. So that's a lot of opportunity that is, is falling by the wayside or sitting in here somewhere that we need to have clarity on. So again, team, pipeline clarity is huge here. If all of you sit here and say, no, I meet with pretty much every single buyer I set an appointment with, I'm just not statusing the leads correctly. Hey, that's on you guys then, okay? If, if someone was looking at this and trying to decide, like we have eight partners in San Jose and we have more leads to give, they have to make a decision based on metrics, right? It's not, you know, they don't talk to every team but they look at it, which team should we send more opportunities to? Well, it's the team that's producing. Well, let's look at their funnel metrics. Which team is really driving as many buyers down the transaction funnel? Um, and are they doing that better than the other teams? If they are, then we need to be sending more leads to that team. And if not, we, we got to decrease their lead opportunities and send that delta to other teams that are performing better. Because at the end of this day, at the end of the day, we're all after revenue here, right? Everybody wants to make more money here. Zillow wants to make money here off the referral fee. And so if we have teams that are driving more transactions, that's where the money is for everybody. So fully transparent here. You know, we have no hidden agendas here. We just want to make sure, especially in 2023, that we get the leads to the right teams that are going to perform. Let me take a, a, I've been on a little bit of a soapbox here. So let me step down for a second and open it up for questions. Guys, what questions do you guys have so that we can get gain some more clarity? Feel free to type them in the chat or feel free to raise your hand um, by clicking the raise hand button and we can call on you. This is your time, guys, to ask questions. You have, you know, our Zillow Flex Growth Advisor took time out of his schedule. So if you have questions, please make sure you ask them because uh, we want to make sure that there's no misunderstandings. We want to make sure there's full transparency and we understand exactly what, you know, what's expected of us. I think we're good, Andrew. Yeah, good. Okay. Um, sorry, I, I've been monitoring the chat. Jason, can you monitor the chat so and, and let me know if there's a, a question that uh, that they have? Um, yeah, just let me know. Oh, here's hey, one he, question. Uh, okay. How yeah. can I get the acceptance rate up? I had zero connections last week and one before. So are you saying how can you get more connections? Is that the question, uh, Roscoe? Do you want to unmute yourself? Yeah, so I I can never get the calls accepted and I answer it immediately and I put accept like in less than half a second, but uh, I never get connected. And I almost had one that was a text and then after listening to the message and I accepted, somebody else already took it. I'm like, I don't know how much faster I can go. It's pretty instant. Got it. And I don't see Roscoe's name on there, Thomas, uh, Thomas Roscoe. Am I not seeing your name on this? Yeah, this is, oh, sorry. This is, uh, yeah, it's probably scrolled down. This is only, I can only uh, get this many on it. Let me, let me open up a spreadsheet here. Uh, that would be six months here. So that data is actually on this spreadsheet here that we can take a look at. All right, let's view. Okay, uh, 
don't we sort this table? Okay. Um, it's Thomas Roscoe, I think he's number 28. 28 year, okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so uh, when the calls come in, Thomas, you know, there, there's everybody's phone is ringing at the same time. Uh, and it is, you know, I just wanna make sure that your phone's ringing. So that's the biggest thing. If it's ringing, uh, and you take the call, but it's been picked up by someone else on the team. It's just they picked up faster or their phone was a little faster. I'll, I'm I'm not a tech, ex, a tech expert, but the Thomas, are you using an Android or an iPhone? Using Android. You're using Android? With, okay. uh, Verizon. Yeah. Android users are at a disadvantage from a tech standpoint because the platform is iOS optimized. And not just iOS, but agents that have like the newest version of the iPhone and have a lot of memory on there, their phones tend to just be like a split second faster. It's just a tech thing, you know, it's built for iOS. If you have an Android, I mean, that's, it, it's gonna be a tad slower. I'm not going back to Apple. <laughs> okay. I hate it. Yeah, it is what it is. I mean, if it's worth it to you, then it is. If it's not, it's not. So. Um, so also make sure that everyone is updating their app, their premier agent app, uh, you know, as often as possible. If there's updates, make sure you update it. If there's updates to your operating system on your phone as well, make sure you update that as well. Memory does make a difference is what I'm hearing from our tech support team. You know, if you have a lot of memory on your phone, then, you know, it's, it tends to run faster for whatever reason. Don't know why. That's what they say, though. I'm running on the S22 Ultra, so it has a lot of memory. Okay. Yeah, I think the big takeaway, you know, for Roscoe and anybody else is Andrew is telling you what it takes to win, right? That's the big takeaway here. If Andrew is telling us that there's thousands of leads coming in, and if you have an iPhone, you have a slight advantage over everybody else, to me, if, if I was in your position, I don't care if I hated whatever it did. If it's going to make me money, it would be worth me adjusting or, or compromising to make sure I have a slight advantage over somebody else. So I think we got we to gotta take that into consideration, right? If you want to be successful, sometimes you got to use certain tools that you don't like. I don't like certain tools that we use. DocuSign is a pain in the ass, but we got to use DocuSign to get deals done, right? Like it's, it's just a matter of... of what it's going to take to make the job happen, especially in this market, guys. So uh, I encourage you to see it from that standpoint and try to see it from that standpoint. Andrew's giving us the, the keys to success right now, right? You got to pick and choose what you do with those. Let me do a quick sort here. Oops, I didn't mean to do that. I meant to hide. All right. Um, what's important for here? us to see here there's certain metrics here that um, i want to highlight so this is the one the met rate right so let's highlight this one right here okay uh how are we all doing on met rate right that's a question here so i'm going to sort this by largest to smallest okay if you are at 45 percent on your met rate or above you're at the benchmark that we set for our partners. 45% met rate is what we're looking for. It, it just means that you're getting as more of the first dates to happen than others. So if you're below 45% here, number one, if it's a statusing issue, if, if it's because you just forget to update your leads, well, you're kind of being put on blast right now because you forget to update your leads. It's not, it's something you need to fix, right? Um, give yourself credit for the work that you're doing. Um, if it's not a statusing issue, then you need to work with Enrique and Jason on, hey, what am I doing that's preventing me from meeting more buyers face-to-face? -face? What can I do to make sure that they don't ghost me or cancel on me last minute, right? So little things like, um, are you setting the appointment way too far out, right? If they say like, let's go see it next week. And between now and next week, like they lose steam. I'm like, ah, I've got someone asked me to go to lunch and say, I'm going to go to lunch. 
instead of meeting with the agent, and they're going to cancel on you. Are you setting the appointment within 24 hours or 48 hours of uh, the call coming in? Um, between that phone call, that connection call, and the appointment, are you driving value to that buyer, staying in constant communication, right, and making sure that, you know, uh, they show up, that you text them before, you know, an hour before or the morning before the appointment to make sure that they show up? Are we doing those things to make sure that the appointment happens? Because again, once that appointment happens, there's some magic there that happens as well. The, the depth of that relationship between you and that buyer improves dramatically. We so talked about things, uh, Andrew, like yesterday in our meeting, we talked about making sure we add video message, right? Mm -hmm. Like what are the things that can separate us from other agents? Because we have to assume that if, an age, if a buyer clicks on Zillow, there's a good chance they're clicking on realtor.com or Redfin or something yep. else, right? Yep. So how do we stand out? And that was two video messages. One, as soon as you hang up, you know, just thanking them for the, for the call. And then one on the way to the appointment, just saying, Hey, I'm on my way. I'm going to pick up Starbucks. Do you want something from Starbucks? Uh, look forward to meeting you. Like it's those small things like that. I, and, and also like what Andrew says, making sure you book the appointment uh, in, in a less, you know, further time. Those things all stack up, you know, in my opinion. Yeah. Um, I, great, great points there, Enrique. I would say, yeah, as soon as you get off the connection call, just turn your phone around really quick and record yourself. Do a self, quick selfie video, hold it high, right? So you got the right angle and just say, hey, Enrique, super cool that we got connected. I'm so glad we talked. I'm looking forward uh, to meeting you tomorrow at two o'clock. Um, I'm going to grab us some coffee before that. Uh, but uh, let me know if there's any other homes that you see on Zillow that you're interested in. Just text me. And I'll make sure we get that on our calendar to see as well. And I'll map out, you know, a way for us to use our time wisely when we meet. Something quick like that and they see your face and it doesn't have to be professional, right? It's just like, hey, a quick video message, 15, 20 seconds, boom, send. That's yeah. better than a business card, right? They now put a, you know, a face to the voice that they just had with you. Um, and then I would say, Enrique, the coffee thing is great, but I would twist it a little more and just say, Hey, when you um, uh, when you text them to follow up like an hour before, or, you know, 15 minutes before, call them or text them and say, hey, I'm in, at Starbucks right now. What would you like? Yeah. Okay. Don't ask them, like, do you want anything? Because they're going to be like, ah, no, don't bother. It's okay. Just tell them, like, hey, I'm in line at Starbucks right now. What do you want? Make, yeah. make it a little more sticky, right? It's like, oh, I can't bail on this guy now or this gal now. She, <laughs> they're buying me coffee. What am, I got to go now. Whatever yeah. you can do to create more stickiness. And again, it's just like, hey, that it's showing that you care about this person, that you were really excited to meet them and drive, you know, as much value as you can uh, to their, you know, home buying endeavor. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah, Andrew, a couple of questions in the chat. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, if I have a met and then they are a nurture, do I set it back to nurture? Yeah. What we're looking for is like every time you hit, think of these, uh, these stages as milestones. We want to see how good every agent is at hitting these milestones. We understand. Yeah. Sometimes you meet, you, you show homes and all of a sudden something happens in their life and like, Hey, we need to take a step back from buying. I'm sorry. Okay, great. Can we still stay in touch? Absolutely. Just it's just a tough time right now. You know, just some issues going on in the family. Great. Put them in nurture, but we will still be able to track that. Hey, you've got X amount of buyers through the met with stage, showing stage and so on. Yeah. Awesome. And then the other question was, are the metrics on the screen? Is this the last six months or what? Yes. What are these? Yeah, yeah six last... months. So how you've done on leads you received. So first of all, look at the amount of leads that you've received. I'll sort this by um, who's received the most leads, right? So again, if you think, when you look at a, a list like this, if you've got more leads than the other agents on here, what we're, what we're in our minds, what Enrique, myself, and Jason are thinking is, hey, they need to be accountable for more conversion. If they get more opportunities, if they're meeting with more buyers, we expect conversion to be higher for those, for those agents versus the agents that just got a handful, right? You get more opportunities. It's just like how we distribute leads for our flex partners. If you're converting more and, and better than the other partners, we want to give you more opportunities. If you're not, we're not going to give you more opportunities. 
In fact, in this market, we'll probably decrease your opportunity and send it to a team that's producing more and converting better. So same idea here is how the team should operate. Hey, everybody wants leads. I get it. Everybody wants to get these leads and, and connect with buyers and hopefully close a deal. But if you're going to take more leads, you got to know that you're going to be held accountable for more conversion. Um, and pipeline clarity is going to be the indicator, right? Obviously, at the end, if you're closing, putting deals in contract, fantastic. But if you're not, we need to look at your funnel metrics and, and decide like, well, do we still want to keep sending them leads if they're they're body of work is not that good, right? So that's how you should think of this. Like the, my pipeline is my body of work that I'm, you know, that I'm being held accountable to by my team leads. And if my body of work is strong, then um, there's a case that I can make to keep getting leads, right? Ultimately, you need to convert. Like you want to convert. We want you to convert because no, no one does this for free. Right. You guys all you get these leads. You're typically working for these buyers for free until you get a deal closed. And so that's what we want to see is like, hey, are we are we close to closing? Are we close to submitting offers for the, all these buyers that you said you're working with? That's what we're looking for here. Pipeline clarity. Um. Andrew, question, if they book a new appointment with a nurture, so if someone's a nurture, then they rebook a, an appointment to go back and show homes, do they change the status back to like appointment set? Yeah, absolutely. Take it out of nurture, put it back into the bucket, you know, uh, uh, an active buyer status, right? And move them down the funnel again. And again, that bucket, remember 800 some leads that uh, in the last six months that we received that are in that nurture bucket, you know, the expectation of conversion for that bucket is lower, much lower than the active buyer. So if you can take more of those nurture leads and get them in an active status, that's that's really good work. That's what we want to see is digging into that opportunity, making sure that we're not missing those opportunities there. Because when you, when you tuck it in as a nurture lead, like you're, we don't remind you to provide an update on it uh, until a month later. So a lot can happen in the span of a month if a buyer doesn't hear from an agent. They'll probably jump back on Zillow and look at other homes or talk to another agent. So again, Enrique, Jason, we, we will work on a strategy of making sure we have agents looking at that nurture bucket consistently and giving them as those buyers as much love as if they were an active buyer right now. Yeah. Especially now, since there's more opportunity for buyers right now, right? The, the market is a lot friendlier for buyers right now, better deals and stuff like that. So there's a bunch of people in nurture that can probably be our next buyer that if, if you're not you know, talking to them, they're going to go with another agent. Um, question in the chat, do we add notes on Zillow Flex app or just Firepoint? Um, it's both guys, our CRM and Zillow. You got to keep both of them up to date. I know Zillow, you guys are working on streamlining uh, integrating with more uh, CRMs down the line, right? Yeah, we've done that with Follow Boss already. And I think the next one is um, Boomtown. Uh, I don't know where Firepoint stands with that, but uh, we'll find out. I mean, but it won't be until 2023, sometime after the first quarter, at least. Got it. The other question was, do we have a script we could use to call nurtures like a Zillow script? Um, yeah, any recommendations on the script? I think we did a training video. I can send that to you, Alessandra. There's a video that we did on how to re-engage leads. Uh, we have a script in, in our team resources, but just real quick, Andrew, like any suggestions on following up with the nurture lead that you haven't talked to? Yeah, you know, I think we have some, if you go to our Zillow resources, first of all, all of you should uh, check out Zillow Academy site to find out what resources you have uh, access to. And then also on every profile, you can access resources. Let me just... See if I can jump on the team profile and show you. Um, so if you're on your profile, if you go to help, just go to resources here. Hopefully your account didn't time out here. Yeah. And then there's there's things here that you can look. But I'll tell you this. This is all curated from our marketing department. Um, a lot of this is dated. It's a great question on scripting for nurture leads. But I would challenge this team like everybody's doing the same thing right now. So what you need to do as a team, as an agent is think of like, you have to put your thinking cap on, like, 
what type of value does a buyer who's kind of sitting on the sidelines right now need to hear from an agent? Everybody knows when someone's reading from a script, right? If you get a call from a solicitor, you know when they're reading from a script. And so that's why I'm like, I, scripts are great if you don't have anything, but really the agents that are really good at their craft is being able to speak off the cuff and being very confident in their knowledge of the industry uh, and having a, a really, you know, kind of back and forth didactic conversation with uh, the buyer. And so go ahead and check if we have any scripting or anything, it's in here, but I, I tell you, it's pretty dated and it's probably pretty general. Like it's not going to knock your socks off, right? If you're a buyer, what you need to think of is like, Hey, if, if a buyer is going to give me, if, if a nurture lead, a buyer is going to give me two minutes, what am I going to say in that two minutes, that buyer, you know, Am I going to call and say, oh, hey, thanks for taking my call. So, hey, uh, looks like, you know, we talked with you like three months ago um, and, uh, you know, you said you weren't ready to buy yet. So just wanted to call and check with you and see how things are going. Are you ready to buy right now? I'll tell you, me, I'm like, I'm, I'm just going to hang up the call and then block that number. There's no value in that phone call. Right? I might be more polite. Like, hey, no, thank you. And I just hang up my phone. Yeah. You and need then, to think of curate some really good value added data details that you can communicate specifically for that buyer. If you know what that buyer is looking for, what type of home, you can alert them to new listings that come up, you know, that are brand new that you can, again, it's just like, what would get my attention? Sorry, Enrique, I know you're going to say something there. No, we, we did a training on this uh, probably maybe a month ago or a few weeks ago on how to script that. And the basis, guys, is you need to make sure you have notes and you need to reference back what their pain point or what their issue was back then and come approach the call with some sort of solution. So, for example, if someone held off because they wanted to save more money for a down payment and we know there's a down payment assistance program going on right now, you can call back and say, hey, I'm just following up with you. I know last time. You know, you were saving up more money for the down payment. I wanted to tell you about this awesome new loan program that it might be a benefit to you that can help you with the down payment. See, now that's value right there, right? Or if someone was looking for a specific type of property and you found a property now that matches their criteria, you can call them and tell them about this new property. So just calling and seeing, hey, if you're ready to buy or sell now, that's not going to cut it, guys. You need to reference back what was going on. And what's a solution or a value that you can now bring to that situation? That's when I, if I was the person answering the phone, I would be now open ears to hear, hear you out. And that was the basis for the training that we did, guys. Just, you got to, like Andrew said, you got to put your thinking cap on. You got to think a little bit. You got to do a little digging, do your research, and then strategically call them, you know, and not just do a general script. Yeah, and make sure you guys are, you know, we can make sure we're role playing this. I know Carla did a great job this morning. But again, you know, it's, it's, if you have those notes, you're going to want to use those pain points to go back to. Yep. So you can look here. I mean, there's scripts here. You could check out if there's anything valuable here. Again, I, you know, this is run of the mill stuff. If you want to, if you want to be just like every other agent, definitely level up to at least this. But if you want to be the agent that really stands out, because there's a lot of agents out there, right? Buyers can choose. They have the pick of the litter in that sense, but you have to give them a compelling reason to want to work with you. And that compelling reason comes when, if they give you some time to talk, like you're delivering a tremendous amount of value to them from a industry knowledge standpoint, but also brush up on your, you know, your soft skills. Like, are you personable? Are you pleasant to speak with on the phone? Are you friendly? Like when someone is talking with you on the phone, do they, do they feel like, you're smiling. You know what I mean? There's sometimes you get on the phone with somebody and you just know like they're giddy. They're just happy. They're just smiling. And they're just really, you know, loose and great on the phone. Those are the people that really, those are the agents that really succeed in this, uh, uh, in this industry. Because everybody has the same access to data, right? Everybody can quote days on market in a specific zip code or city. Everybody can quote, you know, interest rates or different, you know, loan programs right now. 
But what is it about your conversation with someone? If someone's going to give you two minutes, again, think of that elevator conversation, right? You got to come up with something that if you if they give you two minutes, you'll knock their socks off. Like you'll just be so pleasant to talk with that. Next time you call, they're going to pick up your phone. They're going to pick up their phone and answer it. Okay. Um, hey, I got to run. I have an 11 o'clock, uh, but uh, thanks everyone for being on this call. I would challenge all of you to take a look at your met rate, right? Obviously, if you have deals that are going to be some buyers that you're going to be submitting offers for, make sure uh, you hold yourself accountable to, to try to push those through. We, we need to hit at least seven this month, right? Um, that is the low hanging fruit. But beyond that, we need to keep building our pipeline and, and you know, fatten up the middle of the pipeline, right? That funnel uh, by meeting more people face to face. So do what we can to improve that met rate because right now we're last amongst all the teams in San Jose, right? And that's not a good place to be at. There's what that means is all the other teams are meeting face to face with more buyers. They're engaging buyers on a deeper level. They're gonna drive more transactions down the funnel. So trust the, the process, the system. I've been doing this for several years now. The teams that have strong funnel metrics convert at a higher rate. They're more successful. And this program is designed uh, to funnel leads to the top producing teams and to decrease the volume from under producing teams. This is the performance driven program here, performance based program. Thank you, Andrew. Appreciate All right. it. Really good stuff. Thank you, Andrew. Our team, please stay on the Zoom uh, so we can just recap really quick. Uh, thank you so much, Andrew, for all your insight. And we got some work to do. <laughs> thank you. Thanks, everyone. Have a good one. Happy Thanksgiving. Thank you, Andrew. Our team, please stay on. All right, guys. Uh, real quick, uh, raise your hand. Feedback. What 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 was the consensus today, guys? What were your thoughts on the meeting? What was the feedback? What was the bottom line? I want to make sure that the points were driven home and we're all on the same page of like where we stand and what's expected. So uh, who can raise their hand and volunteer and unmute themselves and, and just give me some, some feedback. Hey, Enrique, I'll go, man. It's Thomas. Thomas, what's up? Hey, man, I think like a lot of what I got, obviously it sucks to hear that we're last amongst the teams in San Jose, right? Because I think we all know that we're better than that. But I think really what it comes down to is just like the basics, right? Are we updating it? Even myself, right? Am I consistent with my updates? And then um, I think the biggest takeaway I got from it was what am I doing with my nurtures, right? How am I following back up with those to now try to push those forward? Because these were some nurtures that came in maybe a couple months ago, right? Um, when there was a little bit more competition and now that the interest rates are kind of higher, maybe there's some more opportunity for them to get back in. Um, but I think the, the gist of it is like, are we even doing the basics right now, right? Are we, are we, getting down to the bottom line and uh, executing at the bare minimum um, that we should be. Yeah, no, awesome, awesome feedback, man. And yeah, it is back to basics. And with us being last guys, here's the thing. I know for a fact, not everyone is updating their statuses. That's just the bottom line. So the reason we are last, it's not because we're truly last. It's because we're not updating. We're in last place for updating our statuses. That's just what it is. Because I know if everyone's to go update the statuses based off the activity that I see and how many people you guys are meeting and showing homes to, I know we're meeting with a higher percentage than what the metrics say. But unfortunately, guys, that's the metric, right? That's based off the work that we're showing. So it's like when you're in school and the teacher said, hey, you can't just put the answer. You got to show your work and how you got there. Otherwise, it's marked wrong. It's the same thing with this, guys. You have to show your work. If you're meeting with clients, you have to update the status and change it to met. Otherwise, those are the rankings. And it would suck if, if, you know, if we got disengaged or they decided to cancel our leads or, or lower our leads just because we're not updating our statuses, right? Um, and as the market shifts and as things get tougher, that's what they have to go on. So I really want to reiterate that they're going to be basing who they partner with and who they give leads to off of those numbers and off of the work that you show. So if you're not showing the work, we're, that's going to be an issue, guys. That's going to lead to us not getting these opportunities. Uh, Hervin and then Liliana, uh, what do you have? Um, just really taking seriously what he said, get in front of people. 
Um, I think before we were asking, um, it was even part of our part of our follow up call to see if they had an agent, and a lot of us kind of like, oh, they have an agent, like screw that. So I think it's kind of like just like you said yesterday, eliminating that question completely, and just getting in front of them anyways. Um, and I know sometimes we get those BMRs and stuff, so maybe you know a lot of those a lot of times you can't even show the BMR, so finding another way to get in front of them right like recommending like hey this is other thing or zoom but yeah just uh finding some way somehow to get in front of them like physically I think, yep. yeah that's a major key guys the more people you get in front of the more likely you can take that to the next step so it doesn't matter if it's a bmr it doesn't matter what it is you need to book a time to get in front of them whether it's get in front of them at the property if you're able to go show if you can't show that property because it's a BMR, there's a certain situation, then meet them at Starbucks, meet them on a Zoom consultation, let them know, hey, I'm setting that up for you. I'm waiting for them to get back, but we need to meet to kind of go over how this BMR process works. I can meet you at Starbucks or I can show you another property down the street while we're confirming this one, right? So like Turbin said, and just reiterating what Andrew said, if you meet more people, it leads to more deals, right? It's just the bottom line. Uh, Liliana, what'd you have to say? Yeah, I I mean I obviously understand the the like uh, updating it like even me like my numbers are off like I have more that I that I I paid Zillow for them <laughs> they took a they I gave them a referral fee but they're not showing so th that's myself too but I think another one that I I've noticed too was like um sometimes we want to help a, a lead and only ourselves because we don't want to add another agent to it. But I think like we need to leverage the team. Like I don't mind adding people on my deals. Obviously, I'm more than capable of doing it on my own. But sometimes I think like if it's a, a home that's further away or an area that I don't know, like I don't hesitate on asking for help from another agent who might have more experience in that area or maybe I'm busy or I'm not available. I think that sometimes we're like we I want the full commission. I want the full commission that we don't leverage the team. Um, and I think that's something that we need to do as well. Cause I rather help have that person transact with the team with two agents on it, than go somewhere else where, um, because we weren't able to service them like properly. Um, and another thing that I I'd like to point out and I hope it's okay. Um, you know how you met, uh, he kind of, Andrew mentioned like about the iPhone, like if that's something that you have to do, it is what it is maybe as well. Like, cause I know on my end, it is a little bit just on me, I, don't, I, I can't speak for the other agents, going back on FirePoint and then going back on Zillow. Like I, I update FirePoint a lot, probably more than Zillow. And then they're not adding up. So maybe us as a team should also be looking at the iPhone, um, Android analogy. Maybe we do need to go on like the whatever CRMs that they are matching up with Zillow, because I think two people on the chat mentioned like, why well, add the notes on FirePoint and then on Zillow. And me too, I add everything on FirePoint and then it's not reflected on Zillow. And now my, you know what I mean? So that would just be my like suggestion. Yeah. Real quick, Ingrid, let me jump in. Yeah, guys, I, I totally understand that, you know, doing the double the work and putting in both. But one thing that we can do is change the status though, right? Even though the notes may not reflect the same in each one, but changing the status is a click of a button, guys. And that's one thing. And that's where the metrics is coming in from. That's what they're looking at. The notes is just something, yeah, we want the notes there, but definitely bare minimum is just changing the status. And that'll give you credit for your guys' work by just changing the status. Yeah, because because honestly, they Zillow is not holding us accountable to the notes. They're holding us accountable to the statuses, right? So even if you only put notes in FirePoint and you just make sure you change the status in Zillow, that's still acceptable, you know? So that can alleviate some of the work or just simply copy and paste it. Or when you open up FirePoint, just open up Zillow and copy and paste it if, if that helps. But at the bare minimum, you have to update the status. Uh, and then just FYI to clarify, Liliana, I don't know if, this, if there was a confusion, but the only way Zillow talks to FirePoint is the lead will come in through Zillow and then it'll route the lead into FirePoint for you. But it right. doesn't do notes back and forth. So the notes don't get routed. So the the notes aren't connected from Zillow and FirePoints. Um, just FYI, you have to manually enter notes and statuses. Right. Yeah. But um, yeah, like I said, I'm guilty of that too. Like I've, 
I've obviously paid Zillow and that I'm not, it's not showing on my charts. But another point that I wanted to make was just like, like be a team, because like I said, sometimes uh, like I, again, I, I, that's just what I've noticed. Like someone's like, maybe they're not the best person that can service that client, but they still stick with it because they want the full commission. But that's why we have the team, like maybe get someone who is more experienced in that area, or maybe has more bandwidth at the time. That way we can, that, that way we can service them best. Yeah, absolutely. Guys, you guys got to leverage each other. There's all, every single person on the team has relationships with somebody else. There's certain people you guys gravitate to, certain senior agents you like working with, certain junior agents you like working with. That's fine. You guys, you know, form your guys' uh, you know, unions and collaborations, right? And use each other, guys. If you're busy and you have a hot lead that's really hot and you can't go work, you know, work it or show the house because you're showing some other home or you're working an open house, share, get someone else involved if you have to, right? Like always do what you can first, maximize your workload. But then after that, you need to start leveraging at that point. Um, now, if you're not busy, so let me just be clear with this. If you're not busy, you have no reason putting someone else on your lead. The only time you put someone else on your lead is if you're already maxed out and you're super busy. But just simply like, hey, I'm not available or I want my weekends off. Like this is not the business for weekends off. This is when people want to go see homes, right? Like if you're consistent now, if you're out of town or it's a special occasion or whatever, then that's a different story, right? You need some help or some backup. But if you're consistently not available, then we got to, we got to check in on that. If, if that's just an issue that you're having and not making yourself available. Um, so yeah, leverage each other. Blanca, what do you got? Really quick, maybe from a performance standpoint, what we could do is incorporate on our, um, when it's our week as, um, for our huddles or our call sessions, incorporating the Zillow update, maybe twice a week. Maybe we do it on a Monday and on a Thursday um, at the beginning and at the end of the week, allocating some time and or reminding the team, hey, let's go in there, take a few minutes, update your statuses, put some notes in on your Zillow leads, just so that we make it a priority as well. And we're doing it first thing in the morning and then you're done. And then again, Thursday, which is like towards the end of the week. So hopefully not a whole week goes by without you updating the Zillow. Um, yeah. yeah. That's a great idea. Um, and I def I'm definitely for that. So if you're hosting call session, guys, whoever's there with you, take, you know, during the huddle up before call session starts, make sure the statuses are being updated. Now, the only issue we're going to have with that is not everyone is there every day for call session, right? So in a perfect world, Everyone shows up to call session. We all do it together, but that's not an excuse. At the end of the day, if you're on flex, you are responsible to update your statuses. Like we don't have, we're going to remind you, right? Because we need to drive performance and we're going to push you and we're going to do these things during call sessions. That's part of our job to, to push performance. But at the end of the day, it's your responsibility. By you signing up for flex, you are saying that I am agreeing to update my statuses and make sure that I'm following the, pr the proper procedures, right? So it's just want to make sure that's clear. Um, Lisa, what did you have? Hi, um, I just wanted to ask, what if we get on Zillow on Monday and then we're suddenly, we have all of our Friday, Saturday, Sunday booked with tours by Wednesday. Would we then want to ask to pause because that whole weekend is full and we're not pushing anyone new to the following week when they're eager to see homes? Sure, yeah, you can pause. You can say like, hey, Here's the thing, guys, if you're booked and you're like overwhelmed or you don't have the bandwidth to take on any more leads during that week, you can opt to pause, right? That's fine. Uh, I'd rather you opt to pause than you to just keep taking leads and and not being able to service them, right? Or the other thing is you just, you just don't answer any more calls for the rest of that week. That's fine too. But if you know like by Wednesday and you're not going to be able to answer calls for more than a day, then you just probably want to opt out. You know, you probably want to say, hey, pause me for the rest of the week. Okay. And then my reason for being paused is because if we just don't answer the calls, doesn't that hurt our percentages and our rates of showing non-answered? It does if that's a consistent thing you're doing. But if you have one day where you just didn't answer, then that's not going to, right? Like it's, it's going to be averages, right? But if consistently every time you're on, you're not answering your calls, then yeah, your call rate's going to go down. Your answer rate's going to go down. So if you know it's going to be an extended period of time, then, then that's when you need to be paused. 
If it's like one day where, hey, you're busy, you know, or, or something came up or you had an emergency or whatever, or you were swamped that day with, with showings and you couldn't take calls, just don't take the calls, right? Because that next day might not be so bad. So let me reiterate that. If it's going to be more than one day where you can't take calls for a whole day, more than one day, then you need to let me know so we could pause you, right? Okay. And I was also curious because if we pause, say we get booked Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and now we're full. And if we pause, that gives opportunity for other people to pick up because for the last three sessions, I've been pushing to answer and then it'll say someone else has got it. Someone else has got it. Someone else has got it. So I've maybe in three weeks gotten three calls. So it's been really hard to get that call because, you know, whoever else is getting them all the time. But I was just curious if like, that could also help where they're not picking up if they're totally slammed to help give us some people who don't get the calls a little more opportunity. Um, yeah, I mean, the thing is, that's why we have the shifts, right? So the shifts are supposed to help with that, you know, so that it's less people on shift for that week. Um, and then at that point, it is going to be kind of first come first serve, right? Whoever's available. But what I would encourage you, Lisa, is I wouldn't I wouldn't get so caught up in like those details like that. I would just, when you're on, like you're on, make yourself available to answer as many calls as possible, right? In the end, it's going to average out. It'll average out because there may be some weeks where you answered more calls, some weeks where you answered less because you were, you know, not as busy. And in the end, you're, you're averaging out, right? It, it'll, it'll blend itself out. So if you're available, answer those calls. If it's your shift, like, Work your shift, work your schedule because you know you got to take those calls, you know? Yeah, uh, it just looks like my numbers are low, but I'm really pushing and pushing and trying to get it. And it's always somebody else got it, somebody else got it, somebody else got it. So then I just, I guess, as my own person, individual looking at my spreadsheet, it makes me feel like shocked because my numbers are really, really low. So here's what, here's what you can do. And here's what I would rather you focus on. I would rather you focus on the leads that you do have. Make sure you're going all in, all out on those leads. Make sure you're doing everything you can do to follow up with them, to provide them value, to win them over, to stay in touch with them. Um, because the lead flow, it's going to vary month to month, right? Like it's, this is not a, a, like a perfect algorithm where everyone gets exactly this many leads. That's not the way it works, it's going to vary. But the ones that you do get, you need to make sure you're going deep with those and make sure you're exhausting all options, right? So I'd rather you focus on who do I have? Who can I go deep on? And it'll average out. There's, we're all, it's also seasonality. Keep this in mind, guys. It's winter time right now. So there's probably less leads coming in right now because there's less activity on the buyer side and there's less people clicking on properties online, right? Summertime, we had too many leads where a lot of you guys were like, pause me, I'm getting too many. So it's seasonality as well is, is coming into play. Anna, what was your question or comment? Hey, so I think one of the things for me is that we're, you know, I'm consistently hearing um, where we're going back and making that second call to all these clients. And it's like, oh, well, do you have an agent? Or because people are feeling like they don't want to waste their time driving out to the properties and going back to what Liliana said, you, you just want to get in front of everyone. You just want to meet them. And when once you're there, you find out a little bit more about them. You're able to connect with them because honestly, I'm 10 times better in person than I am uh, through a phone, like point blank period. And when you're like in front of people, you're able to sell yourself a little bit more because ultimately like that's what we're doing. We're selling ourselves. We're connecting with people and through a phone, you're not really able to do that. So maybe I, I would just focus on just trying to get in front of them more than having to ask those questions up front before you're like, oh, I have to like go and drive all the way out there. Maybe they're not going to want to do business or maybe they're just kind of shopping around. Just go meet them. Because yeah. I have that a lot of the times where people are like, oh, I don't want to go out there. And I know in the beginning when I had first joined Flex, I was having a lot of success because I was meeting almost every single person in like literally in person, trying to answer as many questions as I could, trying to provide value. And if I didn't know something, hey, I'm going to find out the question or I'm going to figure out what the answer is, right? And yeah. I think ultimately, you guys, it, I get it, gas is expensive, but if we can get out there and connect with them, you're we're going to close deals. Yeah. So that's a good point you brought up, Anna. And I do want to just make that clear in the nicest way possible. If you are one of the people who is calling the client on a second call and trying to like really pre-screen them to see if you want to go out there, 
that's going to be discovered guys. And you will not be on flex because that's not the way flex works. Flex works is you get the call, you book the appointment. You can call them back to confirm the appointment if you need to, or you could send them a text to confirm the appointment and you go out there and you meet them. You don't call them back and then do all these pre-screening questions. Are you pre-approved and like trying to really see if it's worth your while? That's not the way flex works. So if, if you guys are doing that, it needs to stop, right? I don't know. Maybe that was, you know, misintroduced or that was, you guys were coached the wrong way, but that's not how flex works. So just, I want to make that clear guys. You're not, it isn't like book the appointment and then call back and then like pre-screen them and try to over qualify them on a second call. That's not the way it works. Uh, once again, you book the appointment, you confirm the appointment, you call them back to confirm, let them know you'll be meeting them out there, anything like that. And then you go and you meet them and you wow them just the way Liliana broke down how it went on her, on her offer, you know, that she just got accepted in our Tuesday meeting. She talked about it. That's exactly how you should be doing it. And now Anna just said, get in front of them, deliver value. I don't care if you have an agent, I'm going to go out there and try to win you over and try to swoop you from your agent. That's just the bottom line. So just want to make sure that's clear guys. And if it's not clear, this is your notice that it's clear. Dewey, what do you got? And this is the last question and then we'll wrap up. Uh, when is the next interview for Flex? <laughs> the next interview for Flex, uh, we could do it tomorrow at the Thursday potluck. Okay, I can practice. Yeah, so practice uh, Thursday potluck, right? But I think just to just to end with this, Dewey and for anybody else wanting to get on Flex, it's not just about the, the script, right? The script is part of it, but it's about being able to follow through, being able to meet them in person, being able to establish rapport, connect with them, show them the home, being able to bring value to that client when you meet with them. All of that is just as important as that initial script as well, right? Because you can do the best script, book the appointment. And if you go out there and like, there's no connection there, you don't know how to talk to them. You don't know how to display your value. Then it, it doesn't really matter. Right. So um, Dewey, I'd encourage you to work on the script, but then also make sure you're getting out there with some of these other agents and shadowing them and learning from them on how they meet with clients and how they show homes. Cause that's probably the more crucial part to it is making sure you have an awesome showing um, and then we have, we've had training on it, right? We did a whole training with Blanca and Herbin where they broke down all the things that they do. That's a great thing to reference back to. Um, guys, I know this was a lot today. I know this is a lot of information. Hopefully uh, you guys got something out of it, but we got to tighten up the ship. That's what I'm going to end with. We got to really drive these numbers, guys. And unfortunately, we're going to be making some adjustments and some cuts and, and probably pulling some people back. Um, we're going to have to guys, because it's the bottom line. Like if we're, we can't be at last place with our met rate. So Jason, you're going to now see from Jason that he's sending you guys emails now weekly with status updates. We're trying to see who the low hanging fruit are. We're going to be really monitoring this flex, you know, uh, in detail. And we're going to be basing our decisions on who's on flex based off who's following the job, basically who's doing the work, right? Updating statuses, following the script, following the protocol, following the proper steps like Liliana did, stuff like that. That's how we're going to be judging who gets on flex and who stays on flex, right? It's just, it is what it is. We have to maintain this relationship with Zillow. Um, all right, guys, that's all I got. If you need anything, please reach out to me directly. I'm here to help. Uh, thanks for showing up today and we will talk soon. Let's go.